We are interrupting our regular bro- programming to bring you a debate with the Democratic candidates for District 11. Dr. Chris Cooper is the moderator, and you will be able to view this interview live on our YouTube channel and also on demand on WPBM's website. We'll introduce Dr. Chris Cooper and let you get started. Hey, hopefully everybody can, uh, can hear me. So uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, WPVM for having us here today. This is um, I think a, a key part of American democracy is making sure that we have media that are informing us, that are forming our community um, about the candidates and, and where they stand. So appreciate them giving us this much time, and this much open time. This is an unusual and generous um, uh, grant of, of time that they're giving us. So thank you. Um, we're going to move in, in a minute into introductions, going to give everybody who's listening and, of course, the panelists, more importantly, kind of a rundown of the rules. Um, we'll change things up a couple of times, but for the most part, we're going to be shooting for two-minute answers with one-minute rebuttals. Um, for rebuttals, if so, another candidate's name is mentioned, they automatically get the one-minute rebuttal or I uh, might take some moderator discretion at some point and hop in for a one-minute rebuttal there. Um, we'll do a lightning round in the middle that'll change the rules, but basically we're shooting for for two minutes. Um, so again, I'm Chris Cooper. I'm a professor at Western Carolina University and just really glad to be here today with a bunch of folks who are spending their time trying to make um, our region and our state a better place by running for office. So thank you. Um, and with that said, I'll kind of move down the line for introductions. We're going to shoot for two minutes and I'm going to start with Jay Carey. Good afternoon. My name is Jay Carey. I am a father of four boys. I am a retired disabled combat veteran, having served over 20 years in the U.S. Army and all over the country or all over the country, all over the world. Been deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan, Bosnia and in Desert Storm. So there's been a lot of negative talk, a lot of uh, what's wrong with the country and what's going on. But I remember, you know, growing up in the church that when somebody would have an issue, somebody would get sick, there'd be a death, there'd be a, a loss of a, of a job, we'd come together as a community and we'd lift them up. But everything from uh, making them dinners, visiting them, taking care of the kids when they needed it. I remember going over to uh, um, Mrs. Cash's after she lost her husband and cutting their grass for them. And that's the kind of positivity that we, that we as Democrats bring to the table. That's what makes us who we are. We've got a far right Republican Party that is trying everything they can to make us panic, make us believe that the world is coming to an end and that everything that the president is doing is failing. That's not so. In his first 100 days, he rolled back 100 environmental uh, directives from uh, Donald Trump that were very uh, that were, were destructive to the community. And. He's done so much more. We're, we're getting money for infrastructure, money for broadband. We're getting help at every level that we need. What's happening, though, is you have states that are standing in the way of progress. Ours, for instance, without uh, expanding Medicaid. That has been a huge issue. And we need to do a better job of it. And that's when the federal government has to take to move in and take care of things when the when the uh, local governments are taking care of their people. So once again, my name is Jay Carey. I'm running to be your congressman, take your voice to the highest levels of Washington, D.C. Go to jcarryforcongress.com. Thank you. I'm sorry, uh, so we'll go Jasmine next, please. Good afternoon. My name is Jasmine Beach Ferrara. I am honored to be running for Congress in Western North Carolina to defeat extremist Madison Cawthorn and to deliver the leadership that Western North Carolina needs and deserves in Congress. We had Mark Meadows representing our district. We had an empty seat and now we have Cawthorn. And I think it is about time that the people of Western North Carolina are represented by someone who cares about them and will show up every day to fight for the kind of policies that can make a difference in their lives. I am a working mom of three a wife, a minister, and a county commissioner. I am not your typical candidate, and this is not your typical race, and that is a big part of why we can win it. I bring to this race a unique track record. I've run for office twice and won in two competitive, tough campaigns. I, as a county commissioner in Buncombe County, have worked to help lead bipartisan efforts to expand pre-K and respond with impact and compassion to the opiate crisis. 
I have spent the last 10 years of my life doing organizing across the South around LGBTQ issues in small towns and rural communities at kitchen tables and in church basements. I know what it means to take on a tough fight and to win even when folks aren't sure that you can. We are gonna win this race uh, by focusing on several core things. One, organizing in every corner of the district again and again and again. We've been knocking on doors uh, in every county um, since last summer talking with folks who've never had a democratic campaign at their door and we will continue to do that to turn out the vote two by having the resources to compete we have raised more than 1.4 million dollars and this first quarter of 2022 have almost double the cash on hand of madison cawthorn and it's going to take that kind of grassroots fundraising to win this race our average donation is 38 dollars. we don't take corporate pack money um and we are honored to have support from every corner of the district and finally, we will win by keeping the main thing the main thing, focusing on the issues that are keeping folks in Western North Carolina up late at night, whether it's access to broadband, early child education, job creation. Uh, everywhere we go in closing, we talk about love and hope and how we move forward together, not just because those are the values that connect us to each other in Western North Carolina, but it's because we help how we help our community and our country heal and move forward together. Thank you so much. I'd be honored to earn your support. Great. And we'll go to Katie Need next, please. Hey, y'all. Good afternoon. My name is Katie Dean. Uh, it is an honor to be running for Congress here in Western North Carolina. It's 11th. I'm running for this seat because I love Western North Carolina. This is where I met my husband. It's where we've built our community and it's where we've built our business. The, the bar for the kind of representation that we have in Congress couldn't be any lower. And the stakes for the 2022 midterms, the stakes and consequences couldn't be any higher. I think that collectively the onus is on the working and middle class to stand up and demand that our voice be heard in the halls of Congress. Before my husband, Zach, and I got married, we lived working class poor. Between the two of us at one point, we had five or six jobs. I know what it's like to have your back up against the wall with very limited options. And it costs more to be poor. We had the opportunity when we got married to go back to school and get an education and, and start a new path in our lives. And that's what we did. I earned my bachelor's of science in environmental engineering from the University of Georgia. Zach went to the local trade school and learned how to become a mechanic. Since then, I've worked in infrastructure design for rural municipalities and environmental remediation and contamination here in highly toxic sites here in western north carolina i've worked with countless county commissioners city council members grant writers state regulators and federal officials to make sure that we have the infrastructure installed in our rural communities to protect public and environmental health in 2017 we had the opportunity to start our own business and i'm really proud of what zach and i have been able to build together but the working and middle class, we do not have our voice heard. And as small business owners, we're acutely aware of the risks and the vulnerabilities that we face in today's uh, economy. And if there's anything that I know to be true about Washington, North Carolina, in the last 15 to 18 years that I've spent navigating our most precious and raw resources as a whitewater kayaker, it's that as a community, we're hardworking, we're smart, and we're tough. It's past time that we have that kind of representation in Congress. Be humble to earn your support, electkatiedean.com. I look forward to answering your questions. Great. And uh, Bo Hess will be last. Hello, everyone. Hello, Western North Carolina. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Thank you, WPVM and Devine. Thank you, Matt, behind the scenes. It's such an honor to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, I'm sure we're all listening to this and thinking, wow, I wish we had competent government. And we're all probably imagining a safer, brighter Western North Carolina. And that's exactly what BOHES um, campaign stands for. I'm a proud licensed clinical social worker, addiction specialist, law enforcement trainer, community advocate. I've been showing up for this community for over 20 years. I'm in this race because I think more everyday working people should be in Congress. You know, my dad was in the Air Force. I was born out in Lubbock, Texas, where Reese Air Force Base is. And my mom was also a social worker. So growing up, service was a huge part of my life. 
And as a social worker, I bring to the table practical solutions to some very big problems. You know, it, it takes building uh, bridges and tearing down fences and having tough conversations to get things done. My platform stands on three pillars. Number one, safety in our community and our streets. Number two, making sure that every Western North Carolinian has access to affordable quality health care and mental health care treatment. And number three, making sure that we have the dignity of a living wage and we're getting an honest day for an honest uh, or honest pay for an honest day's work. I'd be honored to have your vote in the primary May 17th. If you're unaffiliated, just ask for a Democratic ballot and vote Bo Hess. Join our movement. We're knocking on doors every day in every county. Send me your feedback. I just want to be the best representative I can be for WNC. And thank you so much. Thank you very much, Bo. And before we get to the next question, just to catch everybody up, if you're just joining us, this is the 11th Congressional District Democratic debate um, or forum. There was another one on PVM that is, I believe, archived on their Facebook site for the Republicans that was last week with Justice Bob Orr moderating. And so I encourage you to check that one out. This is a May 17th election and uh, early voting starts April 28th and mail-in balloting is occurring right now. So this is uh, also, I think as Bo mentioned, if you're an unaffiliated voter, you get to choose the Democratic or the Republican primary. If you're a Democratic voter, you either don't vote or you can vote in the Democratic primary. If you're a Republican voter, you, of course, can only vote in the Republican primary. So um, with that, we will then move to a more formal question. And we'll start with uh, Jasmine and then go to Katie, then go to Bo, then go to Jay. And we're going to have two minutes for these. Um, District 11 has a federally recognized Indian tribe, the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians. The Lumbee, located a few hundred miles to our east, have been seeking federal recognition, most recently with the Lumbee Recognition Act, which passed the House, but has not received a hearing in the Senate. What is your stance on tribal recognition in general and the push to recognize the Lumbee in particular? So we'll begin with Jasmine. Thank you. Um, well, I think it's important in this conversation just to begin by taking a moment to acknowledge the history of this region in Western North Carolina um, and the uh, incredible legacy and leadership uh, in the Eastern Band of uh, Cherokee Indians, um, and also to recognize that history that are very painful, um, including the Trail of Tears uh, and, and the amount of work that we have to be doing every day as a country um, to address that past and also uh, to move forward together. Um, I have been doing a lot of listening over the years as an organizer and, and now as a candidate um, to folks in the EBCI about the issues that matter most to them um, and hear a lot about, um, excuse me, issues around uh, making sure folks have access to the treatment they need around addiction issues, making sure that um, there are opportunities around um, children learning uh, Native American languages and the preservation of culture. Um, there is a national issue that's a great priority um, that folks talk about, which is addressing um, the tragedy of, of missing women who've been abducted and um, have open case files. Uh, I think it's so critical for who the person who serves in Congress representing Western North Carolina, I hope it is me, um, to have the opportunity uh, and to take very seriously the opportunity to do a lot of listening and relationship building and trust building um, and understand the unique issues that impact uh, the tribe here or the EBCI. Um, and, you know, tribal recognition and the relationship that happens at the federal level is, is one of the ways um, that, that we attend to that. I would want to keep learning about the issues around tribal recognition for the Lumbee tribe. I know that there's been quite a bit of contentiousness and there's divided opinion around it. Um, and it's my practice to uh, speak directly to people involved on both sides of the issue before having a policy position on that. So I will need to take more time um, in developing that. Okay. Katie? I... I was really disappointed when our representative Madison Cawthorn voted no, um, but not surprised. I, I continue to be unsurprised and disappointed. 
uh, on on their recognition. Uh, had I been a member of the House at that moment in time, with the information that I currently have on hand, knowing what I know, I would have voted to support it. I think it's important that we continue to recognize and support the diversity of in our country. Uh, and I think it also speaks to the connectivity of other pieces of federal legislation that it's our job as representatives to uphold, including the Violence Against Women Act, which is another piece of legislation that our current sitting representative, Madison Cawthorn, voted no on. Uh, and that that piece of legislation has a long-standing history of bipartisan support. Uh, I've spent a good amount of my time in Cherokee, North Carolina, and it's a really, really special place. If you haven't visited Cherokee, North Carolina, I highly recommend it to everybody. It's fantastic. Uh, I think it's our job as a representative, an elected official, or any part of leadership position to, to walk into the various parts of our communities and our district, which is exceptionally large, and listen. Uh, and to do that, first and foremost, you have to show up. Washington, North Carolina doesn't have a representative right now who shows up. Uh, send me to Congress and we will set up the most accessible constituent services we've ever seen. And that includes staying in touch and, and representing all parts and portions of our district. Thank you. Okay. And uh, let's see here. Bo's next. Thank you for your question. I think what is important is for you know us to take a um, you know a hard look at this and making sure, regardless of whether um, our uh, Native American tribes here in West North Carolina or the Lumbee are federally recognized, that we are providing um, resources for all North Carolinians, and especially those who have been historically uh, marginalized and um, biased. So what does that look like? Well, um, Native Americans tend to have higher rates of um, things like diabetes, heart disease, um, depression, suicide, addiction rates. And so making sure that we're providing outreach and services that are culturally accessible and relevant and making sure that we are meeting with them and advocating for what they want and their and their needs. Okay, and Jay. <clears throat> Recognition of indigenous tribes across the nation is of vital importance. Now I have spent time uh, on the reservation speaking with uh, people of the Cherokee Nation I actually served uh, with a member of the Lumbee tribe. So I've heard arguments or I've heard the reasoning behind uh, on both sides. Now recognition brings, it, brings with it uh, quite a bit of, of, uh, of uh, perks as it were from everything from um, college tuition, free college tuition to ability to establish and, and maintain a reservation where they're self-governing they, their housing, like for instance, the Cherokee housing issues, um, a two bedroom, brand new two bedroom apartment rents for 200 or $600, which is excellent. They have the best school system and the best medical insurance of anybody in North Carolina, including me. And I have TRICARE for life. Where the problem comes uh, is the push for recognition is also uh, connected to a desire and a push to, to establish a casino in North Carolina, which would directly compete with the Cherokee Nation's already established casinos. Um, I don't agree with a traditionally South Carolinian tribe moving into North Carolina and establishing a casino to directly compete with our native Cherokee tribe. I think it's perfectly fine if uh, they establish their tribe or their casino on their traditional tr uh, traditional lands, but the issue comes in with them trying to push out another tribe in order to establish uh, something that is not for the people, 
but greatly benefits uh, primarily uh, white owned business, a, a traditional casino company. I'm not quite sure which one they're established with. I think it's Caesars. I know that the Cherokee are joined with, with Harris. They have for quite some time and they have gotten some good, uh, some excellent uh, benefits from it. But I, while I do support their recognition and I would work diligently to get their recognition, I do not support their desire to set up a casino in the, in the uh, traditionally Cherokee Nation lands. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Great. We'll move on. And for this one, we'll do, again, the traditional two minutes. Um, Katie, then Bo, then Jay, then Jasmine. I think I got that right. Um, one of Congress's most important but sort of least flashy jobs is overseeing the bureaucracy, right? Um, from your perspective, how well does Congress fulfill its role in being the branch that is supposed to oversee the bureaucracy, and how can it do it better? How can it do it better? Excuse me. Some bad language there. So one of Congress's most important but least flashy jobs is overseeing the bureaucracy. From your perspective, how well does Congress do in that job? Can it do it better? So uh, we'll begin with Katie. Thank you. I, I mean, the, when, the, when the rubber meets the pavement, I think the bulk majority of Americans are pretty frustrated with the, with the bu bureaucracy uh, that we have today. Combine that with the outrage politics and the divisiveness and the vitriol that we face. Uh, you know, my background is in environmental engineering. I've worked in infrastructure design. I've had a, a front row boots on the ground seat to uh, when the red tape is efficient, it protects environmental health, it protects public health, and you, you can secure and grow your local economy while you do that because we have to have the infrastructure in place. Water, sewer, broadband, roads, bridges, all of it. Uh, I've also seen where the red tape is a mile long and where county commissioners uh, or, or any given elected official will uh, do a lot of political posturing uh, that delays the progress of a pro uh, project and it's on the taxpayer's dime. I've, I've been on projects where you see subcontractor after subcontractor after subcontractor uh, all sitting in their trucks on the side of the road and it's frustrating because I'm like we're we're the ones paying for this uh, and uh, you know so that's maybe a local view at the level of inefficiency and waste. And I think it's one of my largest frustrations. So I'm of the mindset right now uh, that there's a lot to be said with cutting and navigating the red tape so that we have some efficiency and accountability in how our taxpayer dollars are being spent and how our systems are run. Uh, you know, I'll use the administrate, you know, the ACA as an example where you have so much administrative cost that it's top heavy and it, and it costs the people more money. Uh, so I'm of the mindset right now that it's, it's not very efficient. And I think we could do a lot better. Thank you. Okay. Bo. What a great question. I think everyone listening and everyone watching has run into some frustration when dealing with the federal government on some level. And I think, one of the first things that we can do is we can elect younger officials and candidates such as myself who are millennials who understand efficiency who understand how to streamline things also i have a um, master's in social work a bachelor's in social work i'm finishing up a master's in public health from unity in chapel hill and i understand things from a very systems level and how we can really improve systems to deliver whatever it is whether it be care Utilizing 21st century technology, including AI, is going to be um, essential as we move into these next decades. And, of course, reducing uh, regulations where they are overburdensome um, and deregulating the market where we can, where it's still keeping Americans safe. And, of course, getting rid of the administration in our health care um, up to 60% of our healthcare costs are actually administrative paperwork and bureaucracy. So I think there are many ways that we can streamline um, the government so that A, we're moving into the 21st century and B, we're delivering on our promises to keep the American people safe and make sure that we have prosperity and American democracy and freedom for our children and our grandchildren. Okay, Jay. 
I've got a real quick uh, um, note here with the way they're doing with the 30 seconds. If it's possible, because I have a whole list of 30 seconds now, they can just put our name and then 30 seconds. It would actually, if I have to think about what time it is when they do that. Thanks. Um, okay, so we're, we're looking at making it more effective, you know, Congress more effective. And how do we do that? And in overseeing the bureaucracy, just to make sure after all yes. that, we're in, overseeing the, in overseeing the bureaucracy. That part. In overseeing the bureaucracy, absolutely. Yeah. Um, passing a constitutional amendment to vote can reduce a lot of the bureaucracy that we're dealing with from state to state and that the federal government has to deal with in turn. Streamlining our government organizations, reducing over overlapping territories, uh, reducing overall that would also reduce the amount of people and the, and, and the amount of leadership that's in place. Reducing, streamlining, making it uh, a more direct route to the leadership is always important because having been in the military for so long, uh, you're sitting there and sometimes you have three different people who claim to be in charge and they're all saying something different. We need to have, uh, you know, and we're not talking the president oversees everything, of course, but we're talking within the organizations themselves that we have organizations that, that are answering, that are, are being, are answering to one, uh, one office. I think we have uh, too much repetition. Uh, definitely agree with Katie with the red tape. It's always been an issue. We're always trying, every time we try to reduce, we, we uh, make it worse. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, I think about back to those commercials in the fifties and stuff when they talk about, or the, yeah, the fifties when they were talking about, uh, oh, everything's automated now. Everything's electric. Everything's, you can, a blender and, and vacuum and all this other stuff. And besides how just misogynistic, misogynistic they were, but every time they introduce something new to help you do something quicker, it would uh, actually take longer. Uh, and that's what we're seeing in our government. Every time they're trying to introduce something new, things are taking longer and we have to streamline it. We have to eliminate those ones that are those roadblocks and uh, be able to, um, be able to cut right to the chase, get it, get this, get this work done in a timely manner. Things take too long. Thank you. Great. And Jasmine. Primary function of government, whether it's local, state or federal, is to serve people. And that's never more uh, that's never clearer than when it's a crisis situation. Um, and I actually think one of the answers to this question uh, rests in how we do see government respond in crisis situations. That is when government sometimes is operating in its most efficient um, on the ground when you have uh, an emergency command center running and you have EMS and emergency operations happening. So within the world of how government functions, we actually have some examples to look at that I think we can learn from in terms of how to streamline other bureaucratic systems where we know there are delays. And what I think of first in response to this question is some of the most critical issues facing people in Western North Carolina and Americans right now when we most need government to deliver relief aid and services in a streamlined, effective and equitable way. So the way I would think about this question would be how do we um, place particular emphasis and resources on ensuring that government operations related to disaster preparedness and disaster response, including, including how people can access FEMA uh, resources and, and support in the wake of climate related disasters in particular is an area where we need to be constantly innovating, streamlining, using lean systems to ensure that we're delivering effective services. Uh, the rollout of the infrastructure bill is another area like that where all across the country, we are about we are gonna have resources moving to uh, make long overdue improvements to our infrastructure and to ensure people have broadband access. And those are areas where there needs to be uh, accountability transparency, oversight, and again, ensuring that we're using best practices around actually delivering results in a timely way and not letting those projects get clogged with red tape. Uh, the final thing is that I think a role that a congressperson has around this is to make sure that when something works well, for instance, the child tax credit, which was rolled out quickly, reached people quickly and had immediate impact for families to buy groceries, to buy diapers, to pay for daycare, that something like that doesn't get halted because of political polarization and dysfunction. And I'll be someone in Congress who fights every day to make sure that when something is working well, we keep it on the table and make sure it continues to deliver relief to folks in Western North Carolina. Thank you. Great, fantastic. Well, um, try something a little bit different here for uh, just a few minutes. 
Um, we can maybe do a, a speed round. And so we'll start for the first question with Bo, Jay, Jasmine, then Katie in that order. Um, I'd like to ask you all to limit your answers to one to three words if possible. Um, and we're going to do eight of these. Okay. So we'll just kind of keep going around and around for eight of them, one to three words each. Um, so beginning with Bo, and I'll again try to call out order here. What is the most important challenge facing the city of Asheville? Rising crime and prices. Okay. Jay? Homelessness. Jasmine? Affordable housing. Okay. Katie? Affordable housing. Okay. Now we'll start with Jay. What's the most important challenge facing rural Western North Carolina? Jay? Healthcare. Affordable healthcare. Broadband Jas access. Katie? Broadband and healthcare. Okay. Bo? Ac access to healthcare as well as addiction and mental health care. All right. Pushing the one to three, but we'll allow it for, for a friendly audience. That's great. Okay. So we'll start with Jasmine on this one. Go Jasmine, Katie, Bo, then Jay. Congress should pay less attention to what? Headlines. Katie? Mainstream media. Bo? Uh, pleasing the extreme okay. jay fame hmm. Interesting. all right we'll start with katie for this one so we go katie Bo, jay jasmine you can imagine what's coming next congress should pay more attention to what so katie uh, constituent services Bo. authoritarianism domestic and abroad jay Passing effective legislation. Jasmine? Delivering res results that will help people. Okay, great. So for the next one, we'll go Bo, Jay, Jasmine, Katie. We'll see if I can keep this straight. This should be an easy one. Will you commit to supporting and voting for the winner of this primary, no matter who it is? Bo? Absolutely, 100%. Jay? Blue in 22. Jasmine? Yes. Katie? Absolutely. All right. That one was easy. All right. Well, for this one, we'll go Jay, Jasmine, Katie, then Bo. Should Obamacare be left alone, improved, or scrapped? Should Obamacare be left alone, improved, or scrapped? Jay? Improved. Jasmine? Improved. Katie? Improved. Bo? Improved. Well, we're getting all sorts of agreement here today. All right. Uh, so for this one, we will do Jasmine, Katie, Bo, then Jay. Has Congress done enough to limit presidential power? Jasmine. No. Katie? No. Bo? No. Jay? Not in the last four years okay. or six years. <laughs> okay. And the last one, and this will be Katie, then Bo, then Jay, then Jasmine. Um, what country other than Russia poses the biggest threat to American interests abroad? Katie. China. Bo? China. Jay? China. And Jasmine. China. Okay. Well. Lots of agreement on the speed round there. So, okay, for uh, the next, we'll start with Bo and um, like to do something maybe a little bit different here. Y'all have had, I don't know how many forums at this point and debates. We'll just call it a dozen and assume we're roughly correct. Um, and so what I'd like you to do, and, and we'll let everybody start with one of these. Um, I'd like you to ask a question to the panel that you have not been asked yet. Something that ideally that you think should have been asked and that hasn't. And uh, we're not going to call anybody on the carpet if, if somebody happens to forget a question. Please, other panelists, don't come after them for that. So we're going to do the best we can to think of a question that hasn't been asked, that should be asked. And Bo is going to ask the question. 
and then it's going to go to Jay, and I'll remind y'all, to Jay, to Jasmine, to Katie, and then Bo can answer his own question at the very end, and we'll repeat until everybody has a chance to both ask and answer one time. So, Bo, what is a question that has not been asked in a forum thus far that you wish had been? Hmm. It's a great, great question. I think uh, maybe if you, if we are the winner, um, <laughs> if we're the winner, are we going to hire the other uh, candidates on our team? <laughs> okay. So we'll start with Jay. And just for Matt, who's doing great work behind the scenes here for WPVM, we're going to move back to our two minutes on the answers here. So, Jay, an answer to Bo's question. And not only that, but I've already made offers for people to work on my staff. So, absolutely. Okay. Jasmine? Um, I'm honestly very focused on the here and now um, of the primary. Um, I am very much hoping and running to be the nominee. And the first step would be us working together as a team to elect Democrats up and down the ballot between now and the general. Um, and we'll, if I have the honor to serve in Congress, we'll be working to build out an incredible um, and diverse uh, staff uh, across the district. And I, I will take a moment um, to just compliment uh, Katie and Jay and Bo uh, and, and appreciate the tremendous commitment to service into Western North Carolina that they so clearly bring into this race um, and how, how deep that commitment runs. Um, and I think the, um, the policy level background and the skills that each of them bring. So, you know, I think we're, we're um, we don't always have time to kind of share those compliments with each other. So I want to take a moment to do that now. Thanks. Great. And Katie? You know, I, I echo and agree with the, the sentiment of, of Jasmine's statement as one of the front runners in the race. I'm also running to win. And we're focused on coming out of the primary with as much energy and unification of the party as possible uh, because we will need to do a lot and really knock it out of the park on a lot of metrics to win in November. Uh, we're building our team from the ground up. I'm, I'm proud to say that we just had uh, – a little shakeup in our campaign infrastructure in a really positive way. Uh, and our, our, my original campaign manager, Dixie Marie, it's a working class campaign. She's still working full time while she's been working on her campaign. She's passing the reins off and staying in upper level leadership on our team uh, to Andrew Iden, who served with John Lewis for 15 years. Uh, so when we're building out the team and, and how we're gonna run our congressional offices, first and foremost, we will be hiring within Western North Carolina to run our congressional offices districts and, and the, the well-rounded and far-reaching talent that we have. Because as a community, we are hardworking, we are smart, and we are tough. Um, with that said, I'm not offering any jobs at this point for my own political gains. Thank you. Okay. And Bo, you get to answer your own question now. <laughs> yes. Um, so I was talking about, um, uh, in the candidate and just in the election, um, but every everyone who is qualified, even if they don't work, has a seat at the table, um, in my campaign or in my office, I will, this is the campaign that really does reach out to everyone, whether you're Republican, independent and Democrat. And I will say that we get a, a number of interesting responses sometimes to people who don't share our views, but we will still reach out. We'll continue to build bridges and tear down fences. And that's exactly what it's all about is, is that unity and making sure that we deliver for the American people. Great. Thank you so much, Bo. If, if you're just joining us, so we are um, this is the 11th Congressional District Democratic debate or forum. And so we have four of the six folks who are going to appear on the ballot here today, and they're offering their, their time and expertise in trying to, um, to communicate their vision for Western North Carolina and their vision for their candidacy. So thanks for them being here. And we're doing things a little bit different for this part of the debate, which is we're, we're kind of turning the, the, the question back to, uh, to the folks who are running for us and asking them to ask questions of their fellow panelists. So we'll go next to Jay. Jay, what is a question that has not been asked yet in all of these forums y'all have been a part of, which you kind of wish had been. All right, so <clears throat> much like in other uh, 
federal office campaigns, president, presidential, Senate. Um, are each of you willing to make your tax returns public? Okay, great. So Thank you. Why or why not? Great. Sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to cut you off there, Jay. Jasmine goes right to you for two minutes. Absolutely. Yes. Didn't even need the two minutes. Here we go, Katie. <laughs> yes, 100%. Okay. Bo? Yes, sir. All right. And Jay, you get to ask your own answer your own question. Absolutely. Okay. Great. So we'll go next to, to Jasmine for the question part. Jasmine, what is a, a question that in your large number of forums and, and debates thus far that has not been asked that you kind of wish had been asked of the field? Um, what's a, one of the more meaningful conversations that you've had with a voter in Western North Carolina in your uh, experiences campaigning so far? Great. Katie? I love this question. That's a great <laughs> question, Jasmine. I, we had an event out in Swain County last fall, and it was at a public air. It, it was at a public, uh, it was at a private business, and the public were in attendance to it. So it wasn't a closed event. Uh, when all was said and done at the end, it was pretty much over. I was cleaning up. A couple had come up, ordered some food truck food and a beer. And I had my sign. They were like, are you Katie Dean? I was like, I am. And he's like, what are you running for? I'm running for Congress. And he asked if I was a Democrat or a Republican. And I was like, oh, I'm, a, I'm on the Democratic ticket. And he's like, I can't vote for you. And I was like, how do you know? We haven't even had a conversation. He's like, all right, sit down, let's talk. I spoke with him and his wife. He's a registered Republican. His wife, his wife was a moderate Democrat. They both voted for Trump. His wife admitted on, on her own accord, without any prompt from me, uh, that Trump lost the election fair and square because he couldn't keep his mouth shut and that Madison Cawthorn was an extremist. And we had a lovely conversation. At one point, uh, her husband said he thought the climate crisis was naturally occurring. And I told him, I was like, I'm inclined on my background in environmental engineering to disagree with your statement, but let's say that your premise is 100% correct. And then we talked about homes floating on the Pigeon River and the landslide that comes through Highway 129 and wipes out roads and keeps people from being able to get to work when we have these intense increased storms occur. And taxpayers put the bill. The climate crisis is in our house, regardless of its origin, you know, and, you know, the conversation went on and his wife was like nudging him. She's like, oh, she got you. I was like, this isn't a gotcha conversation. I'm not trying to get you, but we live in a really large district. And, and these are our taxpayer dollars that are on the table. What kind of leadership are we going to have? Where are we going to come together to agree with these decisions that we have? And, you know, at the end of the conversation, he shook, he stood up, shook my hands and his wife pledged her vote in the, in the primary. And I took that, I know it's anecdotal, but I took that as a really good sign of the grounds that we can gain in the rural parts of our community in Western North Carolina. And I really enjoyed the conversation. That's a great question. Thank you. Great. Bo? Yes. So the I guess what comes to mind for me is after the uh, devastation of the tropical storms last fall in Cru Crusoe, North Carolina, being on the ground, helping people clean up their house, their yard, their mess, just holding witness to their grief, uh, delivering hot meals, preparing meals, boxing them up, working with some of the churches over there, um, and talking with the people there, um, and just, you know, really reinforcing the fact that we're all human, we're all people, we all want security and love, and... Uh, you know, most of those, I, mean, I didn't ask them for their vote. I wasn't there. Um, I was there as a candidate, but we did no campaigning. Um, and, uh, you know, just hearing their stories and holding space for them um, has been the most meaningful for me. And of course, I have uh, talks with voters all the time. I am myself a registered unaffiliated until I registered for this race um, on the Democratic ticket. And so, um, you know, we have people from all all spectrums uh, across the political spectrum on our team and that we're reaching out to, again, like I said. And I think that's where it starts is just listening, meeting people where they're at and, um, you know, 
um, not agreeing on anything, but letting people know that, okay, maybe if you don't agree with me or you're going to vote for me this time, I'm still going to keep showing up and I'll see you the next time. Great. Thank you both. Jay. Last 4th of July, I was in Cherokee County at Murphy at their celebration. <clears throat> and after the event was over, we were walking back to our car. I start stopped and talked to this young gentleman. He was a uh, sheriff's deputy there. As you might know, or might guess, uh, Cherokee County Sheriff and their deputies are all Republican. But what he talked about is the fact that he has to arrest people who are uh, taking drugs. They catch them with drugs. They're addicted to drugs because he has no other choice. There's no facilities in the area that they can take them to to help them with their addiction issues, which, as we all know, are is a mental health issue. It was frustrating to him. Uh, he said he didn't care who, he didn't care what party the, the representative came from, as long as they were willing to help, because they just wanted help. And that goes back to what I've said from the get-go. Helping people doesn't have a political party. I, he's a Republican. He's not going to vote for me in the, in the primary. He could vote for me in the general. Uh, but that's not what's important. It doesn't matter if they're able to vote for me or not. We got to meet people where they're at. We got to discuss the issues that are most important in their lives and understand, and then we build our legislation off of that. Every conversation I have helps to influence the, you know, my, my platform is based on values, on my values. Those values don't change. I'm 51 years old. I've lived a, a very interesting life. I've been all over the world, dealt with all kinds of different people, uh, people that both uh, respected, admired, and hated and wanted to kill me, the whole gamut. And what you have to do, though, is you have to <clears throat> meet them where they're at, Show them that you're a legitimate, that you're true, you're true to your word. You follow through with what you're going to say, that what you say you do. For instance, my wife and I, we spent over a month in Crusoe. We, we had stopped the campaign, paused the campaign, and we decided to go help them out. Uh, not a day or two. Um, Leslie was making meals. Leslie was doing all kinds of different things there. I was helping dig out people, help them recover, <clears throat> trying to help them with their insurance and things like that. And uh, what was important was that I said, hey, I'll be back tomorrow to help you. And I came back and I came back and I came back. We were back two weeks ago, checking on people, seeing how things we do, what kind of help they need. We, we're always coming back because that's what you do. That's what you need to do as a representative. You need to not only listen to what the people are saying, but you need to come back. We've been to Cherokee County a half a dozen times easy. Uh, and that's what we do. That's that's what that's my values. And uh, that's what I think is important is reliability, accountability, truthfulness and effective leadership. Thank you. Great. And Jasmine, you get to, to answer your end question now. <laughs> well, first of all, just really enjoyed hearing those answers. Thank you all for sharing those. Um, you know, I um, what I think about is, is a conversation that um, I, I, I wish it hadn't ever happened, honestly. I wish it had happened only once, but it's actually happened in, in many of the communities that, that we've been to, um, which is talking to someone who has lost a loved one to an overdose. Um, Western North Carolina has been hit so hard by the opiate crisis, um, and it doesn't discriminate based on county lines or anything else about our lives. Um, and I think the experience of um, listening to um, a parent talk about what it was like to lose a child to an overdose um, and, and the journey that they've been on through that grief and that loss, um, and, and in many cases, and then what it shows up as is, is digging into the work to try to make sure no other family has to go through that heartbreak. Um, and it is just really moving to me. Um, and it also motivates me. Um, it motivates me in my role as a county commissioner to make sure that we are doing everything we can to uh, create treatment options for folks um, and have the kind of programs like community paramedic program that help people get the treatment they need and begin to recover and rebuild their lives and help families find their way back uh, to each other often. Um, this is an issue that brings together all different kinds of people. Um, and it's one that I'm really passionate about. Um, as a minister, you know, I have um, been there with folks uh, when they've lost someone and, um, and in my own family, there's a history of addiction. And I just think the more we're talking about these issues, the more we help people overcome the stigma that can surround them and reach out to get the help they need. 
um, and and start taking that step and there's and the, towards recovery. We have seen now uh, the early stages of data about what hap has happened during the pandemic in terms of overdose rates and overdose deaths, and it is very grim and very sobering. Um, and we're now at a moment in Western North Carolina across the state where uh, opiate litigation settlement funds are about to start moving to local communities in particular uh, to put those homegrown solutions and strategies in place. And um, it, this is an area I'm honored to do a, a significant amount of work on as a county commissioner and certainly something that I would bring with me uh, into my role as a congressperson in DC if I have the honor to serve. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so I think for the last of this series, Katie, what is a question that uh, has not been asked of y'all yet? Um, and which may be the hardest part is coming up with one of those, but a question that hasn't been asked yet that you wish had. Um, and then we will go to, um, uh, yeah, to Katie for the question and to Bo for the first answer. What scientific knowledge or training do you have uh, that uh, helps you make informed decisions at the table in areas where you might not be an expert. Great. Uh, so as a social worker, as someone in public health, we are trained problem solvers and systemic thinkers. And I have been already uh, meeting with really since the beginning of our campaign, January 1st, 2020, um, when we had our campaign infrastructure in place, been really meeting with experts um, in all across fields and sectors, whether that's locally here um, in the healthcare sector, meeting with um, the leadership at Mission Hospital to discuss um, the, the inequities that are in our community and with pay or to highlight the wonderful things that we're doing over at Copestone and in behavioral health for the community. Whether that's speaking with the um, head drug policy researchers at Grand um, and um, getting briefings and um, learning from them about 21st century ways to intervene in methamphetamine, the opiate epidemic which is something I've been really involved in since 2010 as a member of the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition uh, as one of their board members um, and passing some of the most um, who, um, humanitarian laws for our people that other legislators now are actually modeling um, off. And we passed that in a Republican governor, Republican House and Republican Senate here in North Carolina. Um, so it's about utilizing your own knowledge and expertise, but also bringing other people to the table, um, listening to all sides and really making informed decisions. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Jay. Thank you. Great question. So as, uh, as I've already said, I spent over 20 years in the army. Part of what I did in the army was I was a tank master gunner as a tank master gunner. You uh, become an expert in, uh, in electronics. Uh, you also are highly trained in physics. And what that has done for me is it has trained and reinforced. It's basically reinforced my ability for critical thinking. Critical thinking applies to every single facet of what a leader does, what a member of the House of Representatives does, what every uh, parent does on a daily basis. But my critical thinking was sharpened. Uh, it's continued to be sharpened. I have a, uh, a no-nonsense view of the world. Um, and but there's definitely, you know, not things aren't black and white for sure. But I have the ability, and I always have been, able to make an assessment quickly, uh, especially when lives are on the line, which I've had to do many times, and respond accurately, appropriately. So not a, uh, you know, maintaining composure and maintaining that, that ability to critically think. And that's what I'm passing down to my children as well, which is so important that we uh, teach the next generation in this critical thinking skills so that we continue to uh, excel as a country. So that lends itself to every single facet of what we would do as a Congress or congressperson. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Jay, and so Jasmine? Yeah, I bring to this race a really proven and uh, unique background as a minister. 
um, as someone who's been directing a nonprofit organization for the past decade plus, and then someone who's been in elected office since 2016. Um, and what runs through all of those is the need to be a um, dynamic problem solver who works as part of diverse teams to solve problems. And that starts, in my experience, by listening closely to how people are being impacted by problems. And that's probably where being a minister is most front and center, um, is having that experience of being with people on the best days and the worst days and knowing how to listen closely as people talk about what impacts them. Certainly, I think with policy making, we make the strongest, most equitable policies when it starts with an understanding of how people have been impacted by an issue, whether it's affordable housing um, or what's going, what we need to do in our education systems or um, how we address structural inequities, the list goes on and on. Um, I think another critical piece of this is being able to digest a lot of different perspectives, uh, everything from the data and analytical pieces of things to the forecasting to the range of positions that may be held on an issue. Uh, and then from there, work to formulate tables and build tables and hold tables where people roll up their sleeves and develop the kind of solutions that will actually work in the form of policy. Uh, and that's a process of listening, of outside the box thinking sometimes, of compromise, of creative problem solving, uh, of pragmatism and doing it in a way that is achievable um, on, a, on a realistic timeline and um, in a way that's budgetarily achievable. Um, and then one of the greatest perspectives th that I've gained through serving in elected office is that the work certainly doesn't stop when the policy passes. And in many ways, you repeat the cycle starting over. Once a policy is on the ground, you need to start listening again. Is it working as intended? Are there unintended consequences? What's the next step in this policy making area going to be? Certainly when we're talking about big structural issues like affordable housing, uh, like our response to climate change, like expanding pre-K, uh, one solution can make a big difference, but it's never going to be enough. So we have to keep working that process again and again and again, um, staying calm and committed um, and focusing on actionable results throughout. Great. Thank you so much. And Katie, you get your own question back at you now. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, I I didn't graduate high school because I wasn't passing math. I started my adult life with a GED. And I know what it's like to navigate the economy with, with working five or six jobs that all pay under $10 an hour and how difficult that is. And so when I decided to get my degree in engineering, uh, it was a risk. And it was I'm so glad that I took that risk. And as I've entered the workforce in infrastructure design and working and protecting Western North Carolina's water quality and highly contaminated and toxic sites here in Western North Carolina, including the Superfund site right, by, literally right behind my house here in Swannanoa, uh, and as a small business owner and and just having lived working in middle class. I have constantly said that good ideas go to a politician's desk to die. I think we should change that. Uh, so when it comes to the, the, the scientific knowledge uh, and, and training, I really think we need more STEM educated people in the halls of Congress who understand the parameters of different systems, the complexities and urgencies of the climate crisis, and just the, inter the interconnectivity of and the consequences, consequences of the decisions that we make. It's one of the many reasons that I'm running. And, and to be really, really candid and blunt, I think we need small business owners at the table. I think we need STEM educated people at the table. I think we need more women at the table. And I, I think we need younger folks at the table uh, who really understand where the rubber meets the road and i can't tell you how many construction jobs i've stood on i've i've stood next to or on and worked on where you've got guys with hard hats on out in the middle of a lake with no fall hazards over and they just talk so much smack about osha you know and o the osha regulations save lives make no mistake about it i've shut down construction projects because men weren't they didn't have a trench box in place and they were six feet over. 
you know, and so those regulations are important and they save lives, but there's a level of pragmatism and practicality and common sense that I think is really, uh, we've lost the ability to communicate between the policy, our elected officials and our constituents. And uh, I, I think that we bring that to the table and I'm proud to bring that to the table so that we can offer an authentic voice for Western North Carolina. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much. And just want to remind everybody, um, we've got four of the six folks here who are going to appear on the ballot, already are appearing on the ballot for the Democratic ballot for the North Carolina's 11th Congressional District, so the westernmost district in our state. We're very glad they're here today and glad they're taking the time out of their lives um, to run for office, um, but also to try to help educate us on, on who they are and what their platforms are. And of course, we want to thank WPVM for giving us the time and space today. And also the political science professor in me wants to remind everybody that uh, May 17th is the primary, that uh, you can vote right now by mail if you've requested it. We'll uh, start early voting or one-stop voting very, very soon. So you got three different ways to vote in North Carolina, by mail, early in person, or on election day. So you get to, to choose your poison or hopefully your cure in this case. Um, so back to the candidates. And since we started with Katie, I believe on that one, we'll start with Bo on this one, if it's all right. Um, we've, you know, when I think about Congress, right, Congress does three things. They legislate, and we've talked about some specific legislation. We'll talk about some more in a few minutes. Um, they oversee the bureaucracy. We talked about that a little bit. Um, but they also perform vital constituency service, right? They listen to their constituents, they respond to their constituents, and they serve their constituents. So I'd really love to hear from each of you, what is your plan for constituency service and constituency contact if you are to be elected to this position? So what is your plan for constituency contact, for constituency service, if you are to win the seat in Congress? And so we'll begin with Bo on this one. Yes. So when I win this election or any election for U.S. House, I will be on the ground in WNC as much as I can uh, be where I don't have to be in D.C. Um, you know, I've lived here for over 20 years. My dad was in the military, like I mentioned before. So we were constantly moving um, every year, year and a half to a new military base. And so once I found Western North Carolina, I really made it my home and plan on on staying here. Um, also, we will have a constituent office in every county of, of District 11. We will make sure that we are open, that we're accessible. It doesn't matter if you voted for us or if you did not vote for us. We will make sure that if you need help navigating the bureaucracy of the federal government, or maybe you even are in a crisis, or maybe um, you need help ordering your social security card or with a job placement program, or maybe there is some um, hiccup that you're dealing with um, with the actual federal government. I will be there to iron that out for the people of Western North Carolina, no doubt. And part of my job as a social worker, as someone in the human services field who has shown up every day for the people of WNC, this is something that is dear. And this is something that is already um, that, you know, already doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Okay. Jay. So first off, what we're going to look at is we're going to hold our town halls everywhere. Well, in, in each, in each County and everyone's invited. There's not going to be a pre-selected list. People are welcome to come in and ask their questions and tell us their concerns. It's a great way to reach out with people and know that you're actually thinking of them and working for them. The other way is uh, a Congress person gets $2 million a year in order to uh, staff their DC office and to conduct uh, constituent outreach across the district. So realistically, uh, you're not, you're looking at staffing eight, eight to 10 offices, keep, keeping them in, in the, in the key geo uh, geographical areas, in order to serve the most people with the, the most ease. I mean, we have online, we have email, text, phones. So I mean, having one every single place and then uh, limiting yourself on staff is not going to be the best uh, best course of action. We have, you know, every 
there are certain things within the staff that are that are already in place in Congress for those for uh, reps to come into. Uh, VA services, a VA service rep is already they work in they work in uh, in Washington. They are experts in their field. We need people that have done the work before, and that have for certain uh, outreach and certain uh, instances, offices, staff positions, so that they are able to to uh, correctly and effectively provide service work. Having someone that's never you know having some local uh, person that's never actually done the work uh, in a in a, in a a large scale uh, manner because I I know how, what it's like trying to navigate the VA system I do it quite often I'm the only one that, that understands that that has actually done it so I know what it takes uh, and I know what kind of people that I would want I want to talk to when I out when I reach out for help so and then we look at uh, ensuring that we're paying every single member of our staff a living wage. We can't talk about it here while we're campaigning and then uh, then not do it when once, once we're in office. And the other thing that's really important is I want every single person to take a look at who shows up, who's showing up everywhere while we're campaigning. If you're not showing up everywhere and making every concession to the voter while you're campaigning, say you're leaving early, you can't make certain things, whatever, whatever reasons that you have, for me, they're an excuse. Excuses have a, a, an effective range of about zero meters, right? And we want people who show up because if you're not showing up during the campaign, you really think these people are going to show up once they're in office. So show up everywhere all the time. Thank you. Okay. And Jasmine next. Well, there are two main ways I think about this question. The first is that uh, if I have the honor to serve in Congress, my singular job will be to represent and serve the people of Western North Carolina. Um, and then I also think about the approach we've taken since day one of my campaign, which is organizing everywhere early and again and again. I've personally knocked doors in every county across our district to be having those face-to-face -face conversations with folks who may not show up for forums or tune into forums, but have a lot at stake right now. Um, and that's exactly the way that we would approach constituency services if I have the honor to be elected. Um, we'd come out from a perspective of building out services across the district to create as many bridges into governmental services as possible for folks to make it as navigable as possible. That would mean things like um, hiring folks with social work backgrounds, for instance, to be navigators. Um, so they could listen closely to the issues that people are, need help around and then help them figure out uh, how to move forward and how to get the results they need. Um, it would mean hiring a team of folks who are representative of our district uh, geographically in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of educational background. Um, and it would mean being out there, not waiting for people to come knock on the door or show up to an event we hosted. Uh, this organizing um, that's really at the heartbeat of our campaign would continue to be at the heartbeat of constituent services. It's going to where people are, wherever that is, and making sure they know about services that are available to them. And we know that particularly matters around some key issues in Western North Carolina and the years ahead. Um, there's going to be not need to be a lot of support for folks around um, participating in the broadband expansion programs that will happen, whether they're administered at the state, local, or, or federal level. Um, one of the key roles that a congressional office can play at, in the district level is helping people navigate what level of government they need to be interacting with and what agency. That is not always obvious and clear. Another key area, of course, as I've talked about several times, is around disaster preparedness and then disaster response. Um, being there on the ground in communities that are impacted and making sure that everyone from um, community members who've lost their homes to local government officials have all the support they need in accessing immediate uh, relief, but also ongoing forms of federal assistance and support. Um, a final piece that I'll add here is that we would absolutely have a strong internship program um, as part of our in-district um, constituent response. We have an amazing team of high school students and college age young adults um, on our campaign team and you know, really see all of this as about creating more opportunities for young folks in Western North Carolina to be part of not just our politics, but part of our government. 
uh, and running through all of this would be a commitment to not just paying a, a living wage, but a, a wage that folks could actually follow their dreams on and raise a family on. We're certainly doing that on the campaign trail. I fully support the unionization efforts that are underway in the halls of Congress right now with congressional staffers. Um, and we'd be proud to be in uh, to be providing jobs um, that are exactly the kind of jobs we need in Western North Carolina. Thank you. Great. And Katie? I, I want to start with saying we win this seat. I think we have a unique opportunity to win this seat in this race, in this moment, with a level of energy and enthusiasm that Western North Carolina hasn't had in the Democratic Party in well over a decade. We win with authenticity. We win with grit that can go head to head and toe to toe against Madison Cawthorn's branded extremism and its unchecked nationalism. And I think we win with the patriotic resolve to stand up for the working and middle class as we navigate an economy that doesn't work for us. We hold this seat in 2024 because this will be one of the most vulnerable seats in 2024. And you better believe the Republicans are gonna be coming for us. We hold this seat with the best constituent services Western North Carolina has ever seen before. Uh, I pledge to have more staff in our district than we have in DC uh, and that we have an allocation of, of, of talent and resources uh, so that we can be as effective as possible. Uh, and as a small business owner, I'm used to doing more with less. Uh, and we've been running our campaign on that same premise. And I'm proud to uh, just continue to belabor the point that we're incredibly competitive in this race as a result of that grit. Uh, we will recruit exceptional caseworkers and we will pay them well. In fact, uh, they just had a 21% increase in the, uh, the members allowance, mem uh, representative members allowance. And I'll devote all of that money con to constituent services. And, uh, you know, as Jasmine said, every single candidate here has already got on the record to say that they fully support the uh, unionizing efforts uh, in, in the halls of Congress. So, I and there's two kind, I think there's two kinds of congressional representatives that we have. There's those who live in D.C. and there's those who come back to their district. There's those who are on CNN and Fox News on the daily. And there's those who quietly work behind the scenes and, and, and really show up a, and do the heavy lifting in the committee and subcommittee meetings. I want to be the kind of representative that's determined to deliver authentic, tough, hardworking, smart representation. I want to be the representative that that stays here in district, focusing on what our needs are. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Katie. And thanks everybody for being here. And of course, thanks to the listeners who are taking an active part in your democracy. Um, I appreciate it. We appreciate it. So, so thank you. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, ask one more traditional question with the two minute responses like we've been doing. And then after that, move into um, move into closing statements. I believe if my uh, uh, very fancy yellow tablet is correct, then Jay is going to start this round. Um, so for the question, the city of Asheville has made headlines for its reparations program, but Congress could have a role to play here as well. Proposals for reparations have been brought up in most sessions of Congress, and there was even a proposal brought up to study the issue in the 117th Congress. What is your stance on reparations for African-Americans and what role, if any, should Congress play in that? And so we'll begin with Jay. Uh, yes. So I attended the reparations um, event that they was hosted in Asheville uh, last year, talking about um, what reparations can and should look like. How do we get there? Uh, what's it going to take? Uh, what kind of initiatives? One takeaway I had from that is that there there are multiple cities that are addressing reparations, but they're all doing it in their own way. I support a federal agency that helps to guide uh, towns, cities, you know, local governments in their in their quest for providing reparations. Reparations are important. We have denied uh, marginalized communities, uh, the black community, especially of the ability at having generational wealth. Asheville, in the name of progress, uh, stole 
land, stole homes, and uh, they they owe those owners the right to have their land back, their homes back. It's been done in California. It's been done all over, I believe Cincinnati has, has established a reparations uh, committee and they're, they're, they're doing their reparations, but I, I've been disappointed overall. Uh, let's look at Buncombe County in itself. Their traditional land that was, should have been part of reparations was sold to a major corporation in order to build a factory and they sold it for $1. I understand the need for jobs. I understand the need for uh, progress. I, I understand the need for good paying jobs and careers, but not at the expense of people who lost their ability to have any kind of stability because of the local government. Reparations are important. They're needed. They're long past due. But I believe the federal government can help with that and, and guide local governments on how to accomplish that because it's always seems like every time a local government attempts reparations, it's like it's being done for the first time. There's, it takes so much time and it delays the process. We can speed that process up. We can make it more effective, more fair, more equitable. Uh, thank you. Okay. Jasmine. I think we start this conversation by talking about issues of racial justice in our country um, and talking about the reality that there is incalculable loss and violence, loss of life and violence against African-Americans um, through the brutal practice of slavery, um, through the Jim Crow era, uh, and that racism continues in the United States right now. And it is the work of every generation to show up in every way possible to create racial justice and racial equity and the healing that goes along with that. Um, so that's how I enter into this conversation is the ways in which it connects to all the other critical policy issues where racial justice is at the center, whether it's voting rights or healthcare equity or affordable housing uh, or criminal justice issues and the urgent need for criminal justice reform. There is a bill under consideration in Congress that would formally commission uh, research and recommendations about how to move forward with this at the federal level. Um, and I think that's the step that our country needs to take. It needs to be at the federal level. It needs to be done in a way where there are many, many opportunities for voices to be heard on these issues, where there's full transparency and where we reach a national uh, level of understanding about how we're going to move forward with this. Um, and, you know, this is something that um, I think each and every one of us has a, a serious and lifelong commitment to show up around and make sure we are using our voices in every way we can to advocate for a full reckoning with uh, the history of racialized violence and racialized discrimination and racism in our country. Um, and the reality that uh, we have work to do each and every day at the uh, every level of our lives. Um, and certainly that work needs to happen in Congress and through the federal government. Thank you. Thanks. Katie. Uh, I want to I want to give a quick shout out to. I wish Eric Gash was here. He was one of the candidates that were running with us over the past year. And unfortunately, he wasn't he didn't go on the ballot and. I wish he was here because I would love to hear what his stance and answer on this question is just as, um, you know, a human and a person on the campaign trail. When we, when we talk about racial equity in our country, I, I think it's really, history matters here. From generation to generation, we have fought to expand more civil liberties to more Americans. Uh, at a really high expense. And that progress has been a really slow wheel to turn over. And I've seen it play out over and over again. And in, in my experience with, with infrastructure, having designed pulling lead-based pipes at a low-income neighborhood in rural communities. Uh, and, and you see when the gentrification sets in uh, and how it changes the socioeconomic landscape 
of the community, you know, for whether people want it or not. And when it comes to reparations, I think that the city of Asheville at the local level is, is leading the stage for the national conversation. And when you pioneer new policies like this, uh, it's, it requires a really large think tank. I will say that my concerns as a Buncombe County taxpayer is that the red tape and the administrative costs are going to eat up any sort of efficiency uh, for having any sort of systematic impact. And I just, you know, at the local level, I, I, that's, that's my concern. It's not to say I'm against it in any way, shape or form, I, you know, but there's a large distrust about how our taxpayer dollars are being spent. Uh, so, you know, I agree that at the federal level, when we when we talk about racial equity in our country and what that means for our economy and people to be able to cultivate generational wealth you know we've i mean i'd say that's that's a really we all we all live under a really big umbrella of economic disenfranchisement you know and some are more ahead than others i think the, the wealth to income disparity gap that we have in our country right now is is one of the largest threats that the next generation faces combined with the fact that white supremacy is the largest domestic terror threat that our country currently faces. So, you know, when you combine those th two things, uh, yeah, we need to bring the conversation of reparations and, and economic equity into the fold of the national conversation. And I'm really proud that our local city is leading the conversation for doing the heavy lifting to figure out what works and how it works. Uh, so thank you. Great. And Bo, to finish this one off. Yes, this is one of those many issues that does start with tough conversations. And um, when I speak to Black African-American individuals in Asheville and in Buncombe County, when I'm on the ground in Shiloh, in Deaverview, in Piscaview, um, when I am outside of Aston Towers speaking with voters, um, a lot of people um, feel the reparation thing is a very Caucasian, white-led endeavor here in Asheville, and they laugh at kind of the inconsistencies. For example, one of their proposals was that Black people, in order to qualify for the reparations, you would have had to live here for a certain number of years, um, made sure your taxes were um, up to date, and you graduated high school. And so a lot of the folks that I spoke with were kind of shrugging their shoulders at this and saying, this doesn't really apply to us. This, this, this really isn't for us. This is all kind of showboating. And there are also some inconsistencies just in the contracting and all that at that and you know and, and who is running that that i think that people need to be very aware of and watching very closely um now i'm a social worker i'm practical right what can we do right now we can end felony disenfranchisement we can end cannabis prohibition we can um have automatic voting registration um and we can in um uh closed primaries we can um, um, remove cannabis off the federal prohibition list, and we can also reform the credit system and introduce postal banking. So things that we can do that can help more some of our marginalized and disenfranchised communities and bring them into the loop and make sure that we all have access to providing for our family and living in safe communities. Thank you, Boo. And Thanks, everybody, so far for what's been, at least for me, very, very informative discussion. So we're going to move into to closing statements. Again, thanks to the candidates for being here. Thanks to WPVM for having us. Um, thanks to Matt Henson, who the folks listening uh, don't see this, but Matt's doing an incredible job keeping everybody on time and making sure this whole thing runs smoothly um, and handling all the parts of this that, frankly, none of us are. Well, I'll speak for myself. I'm not qualified to handle. So thank you, Matt. Um, so we'll move into two-minute closing statements. We'll go Jasmine, then Katie, then Bo, then Jay. So Jasmine. 
when my wife Megan and I made the family decision that I would run for Congress, um, we talked a lot about what this moment means. We have three kids. Our son Calvin is seven and our twins, Lily and Wyatt, are three years old. Um, and one thing that was really clear to us as parents is that we want to be able to say to them that in a matter, in a moment when so much was on the line, we did everything we knew how to do to create the kind of change that our country needs right now. Um, there is so much on the line for folks across Western North Carolina, and it is uh, a travesty that we have not had competent representation in Congress fighting for the people of Western North Carolina day in and day out for many, many years now. There's more at stake in this race than just that, though. In the form of Madison Cawthorn, we have a far right extremist who is using his platform in the most dangerous ways to spread division, to spread a toxic form of politics that's trying to tear our country apart at the seams, um, and to be absolutely connected to extremist movements um, within our country. There is a way to win this race. And we are uniquely positioned as a campaign in the Democratic primary, not just to win the primary, but to go on and win the general. Uh, and we're doing that in a way that is about bringing people together around the values that shape us on the best days and the worst days of our lives, um, the values that we hold true to. Uh, this is about bringing people together around issues like how we respond to the opiate epidemic and how we expand pre-K and how we create the kind of jobs you can raise a family on. Those are issues that bipartisan teams of folks in Western North Carolina work on every single day. We are running this campaign based on a belief that it matters not just in the lives of folks in every county across our district, but based on a belief that what we do here in Western North Carolina in 2022 sends a powerful message across the country about what's possible in our country right now and how in exactly the districts where extremism has been on the rise, we can push back and fight back and instead focus squarely on what we need to be doing as a country right now, which is healing, sitting down at the table together and figuring out how we move forward together to tackle the great challenges of this time. We are out knocking doors all across the district. We would love for people to join us uh, as we get ready for early vote. This is a grassroots campaign in every sense of the word. Uh, as organizers with the donations we're getting, I got a wrinkled $5 bill in the mail today with a note saying, this is what I've got today. I'm in it with you. Um, anyway, folks are ready to join us. We would love to have you do that. You can do that at jasmineforcongress.com. But above all, I wanna close with a message that this is a winnable race and it's one we've got to win because there's so much on the line. Thank you so much. Okay, Katie. I really appreciate the opportunity to come on and, and introduce ourselves as candidates in this race and uh, you know, to WPVM and, and Dr. Cooper and all the other candidates who've showed up. Uh, I, I just, I really think we need people in the halls of Congress who know what it's like out here we are we are in the race of our lives right now and again the stakes and the consequences of the 2023 midterms couldn't be any higher and when i say we need people in congress who know what it's like out here i'll i'll use my healthcare story as an example i left full-time work in environmental remediation to help grow our family business and when we made that decision we forfeited our access to affordable health care because it costs more than our mortgage payment per month. And so we did what any young, healthy 30 year old couple that's putting all their chips on the table on their business does. And we went without it. I broke my collarbone as an uninsured person. And I had a temporary pin, a deck screw put in the inner diameter of my collarbone. We had it removed without general anesthesia because it saved me $15,000 in healthcare costs. The guy who shot the film for our, our launch video, his daughter requires life-saving medication that costs $20,000 per month. I don't know what to do other than stand up and run and say our voice and our stories, and our, they're not being heard in the halls of Congress. Uh, and they're certainly not being addressed legislatively with the legalized corruption that we have in the status quo politicians, the vitriol, the political divide, it's designed to keep us divided. 
And, and while, they, while they beat that drum, they purchase politicians to do their bidding for them. Send me to Congress. And, and I pledge to never, ever, ever take a dime from Johnson & Johnson Political Action Committee. I promise to never take a dime from the telecommunications companies that are working really hard behind the scenes to buy the primary candidate so that they don't have to change the language that would make them install rural broadband in our community. My whole life, I've heard that the system's too big, too corrupt, too, too bought and paid for to be addressed. And look where it's gotten us. If we do not fix this, we are on a very dangerous path, the precipice for backsliding in our country, for our economy, the social fabric of our country. Uh, we, this is serious. We need pragmatic, level-headed leadership that can, only not, that can not only reach across the table, but we also need to give people a hand up, and then we need to hold the line against the extremism and the authoritarianism that we face. To do that, you need to be dynamic. My name is Katie Dean. I'd be humbled to earn your support in the Democratic primary on Tuesday, May 17th. ElectKatieDean.com. I'm really proud of the momentum that we have. I'm frustrated with the pay-to-pay -pay economy, uh, with campaign, the lack of campaign finance reform, but I will end on a positive note in terms of the strength of our campaign. Uh, we've raised more in the last two weeks than we did in the last quarter. The trends matter. Momentum matters. I'm really proud of the movement that we're building. And I, I really look forward to election day and turning out the vote with everybody. Thank you. Okay, Bo. Yes, thank you again, Dr. Cooper. Thank you, Matt, behind the scenes. Thank you, WPVM. Thank you, Katie, Jasmine, and Jay. It's been awesome to be in this race with you. Again, my name is Bo Hess. I'm a proud licensed clinical social worker, addiction specialist, and as someone who has shown up for Western North Carolina for the last 20 years, and worked with families and people all over the district. Um, I've come to understand that no matter what political stripe you are, we want the same things. And it's about tearing down fences and building bridges. You know, I come from a family of both Democrats and Republicans. And so I know what it's like to be able to hold peace at the holiday table. And we need to be building resiliency against authoritarian um, tendencies, both domestic and abroad. I will make the people of this district number one as your representative. The people of District 11 are hardworking. We're good people. We reach out for others. We take care of one another. And I believe we want safety in our community and streets. We want access to affordable health care and mental health care. And we want an honest day pay for honest work. We want the dignity of a living wage. And I think we need to do more turning in with each other instead of turning on each other. You know, I've never asked my patients, is there a Democrat or independent or Republican by their name? But I've shown up every day and helped put practical solutions to their very big life changing challenges. And that's exactly what Western North Carolina can expect from me as your representative in Congress. Remember to vote Bo Hess in the May 17th primary. Let's get a true uh, person. Um, I've been working this whole time running my campaign. It's really been an honor, but let's get someone who understands the issues, been on the ground, and number one, can stand up to Madison Cawthorn and their vitriol and extremism. If you're an unaffiliated voter, make sure you ask for a Democratic ballot and vote for Bo Hess. And thank you so much, everyone. Okay. And Jay? Tell you, things are tough. They're tough all over. And, you know, we don't need somebody coming in reminding us of how tough things are and just complaining about things, but someone coming to us with solutions. And that's what my platform represents, actionable solutions. It, I take a holistic approach to the problems that, this, that face this district, this state, and this nation. All people, regardless of which political party they have that they subscribe to, share in the same issues. We need somebody that has common sense, has a proven track record of leadership, that knows how to lead in good and bad times, and is willing to listen 
to whomever has a good idea, has a solution. If we don't elect, if we don't put through the primary the right person to win and carry this district, we will not turn this district blue. And it's of vital importance that we maintain our majority in House of Representatives. We cannot afford to lose a single seat. We must gain every single seat that is in jeopardy. And this seat is winnable by the right person. I am the candidate that appeals to the Democrats across the district. I am the candidate that appeals to those unaffiliated looking for a better way, someone with good solutions that makes sense to them. Looking for somebody, those unaffiliated votes, unaffiliated voters, they respect someone with military service that dedicated and sacrificed for this nation for over 20 years. Because they know that I will not be cowed and I will not back down when I am trying to stand up for what's right for my district. I did it for you in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I'll do it for you in Congress. My name is Jay Carey. You can go to my website, Jay Carey for Congress. We are we're running a great campaign, and I want to thank my campaign. People are working on my campaign. They they have they have. Uh, kept me sane over the last uh, year. I uh, thank my wife, Leslie, and my four boys, Christopher, Quinn, Ari, and Levi, ranging from 24 to two. So we have a, a full house. We have our handfuls, but we knew it was important for me to step up because I'm the one that can win the district. I'm the one that can make change in this district and in this country. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Jay, and thanks for everybody for being here, especially thanks to WPVM and thanks to the listeners. Um, just in conclusion, this is a May 17th primary. I want everybody who's listening to remember this. This is not about the general election at this point, although for one of these candidates, it will be. Um, this is about the primary election. This is the Democratic slate that you're hearing from today um, to run a democracy, right? We need uh, good candidates. We've heard today that we have many of those. Uh, we need media to help inform us. Uh, we need election administrators to process the ballots, and we're having that go on all throughout West North Carolina. And then we need voters who are willing to be informed and cast an informed ballot. So hopefully by listening today, you can move forward uh, on that last goal. And remember, May 17th primary, vote by mail, vote um, uh, early but in person, or vote on election day. So thank you very much.